Jesus has a solution. Dr. Jesus has a medication for every spiritual malady. When, I, when you read the rebuke that Jesus gave the Pharisee, you almost want to think that Jesus is being rude. He told him, you're a, you're a whitewashed sepulchre. Outside you appear to men like you're good, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. You almost want to think that Jesus is being rude, but when I thought about it, I said to myself, this is the only counsel that will help them. Are we together, brethren? There are some people that the only thing that can help them is to tell them the truth. You look like a Christian, but you're living like the world. Dr. Jesus. I give your support. Today, the message I share with you it's entitled, God's Message to His End-Time Church. God's Message to His End-Time Church. Let us pray. Father, may your Holy Spirit take charge now once again. Speak through me. Speak through your word. Bless your people and glorify your name, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It was Jesus in the book of St. Matthew chapter 16 who said, Upon this rock I build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus, in fulfilling this promise, he sent the Holy Spirit to take care of of his church after his departure and he also commissioned the apostles to take care of the flock specifically to Peter in John chapter 21 and verse 15 he said when they had finished breakfast Jesus said to Simon Peter Simon son of John do you love me more than these he said yes Lord you know I love you he said feed my lambs and it was the Apostle Paul in Ephesians, in the book of Acts chapter 20, who charged the elders of the church to guard the church over which God had made them overseers. The apostles helped to guard the church, the young church, the apostolic church, by their personal visits and their letters, which some of them we have now called epistles. Matter of fact, most, if not all, the New Testament was written to, to fulfill the commission that God gave to the leaders to guard the church of God. One of the first examples in the phone in the book of Acts chapter 15, when there was a conflict about um, the Judaizers who were trying to impose their legalistic views on the, on the Gentile converts, the apostles came together and they made decisions and sent that information to the church. You have the book of Galatians where, and Romans where the apostle Paul addressed the matter of righteousness by faith. In the book of 1 Corinthians, he addressed the matter of disunity. And the book of Hebrews encouraged the Hebrew and Jewish Christians. But my brother and sister, the time came when the apostles died, are we together? And the only living apostle was the apostle John who lived to a very old age. And in this time, in the time of the apostle John when he was alive, the church faced severe persecution. As a matter of fact, John was a prisoner on the Isle of Patmos because tradition tells us that they tried to kill him by putting in a pot of boiling oil, but he would not die. And so they isolated him with the intention that he wouldn't be able to carry out the work of feeding your flock. Let me tell you something, brother. Let me pause here to tell you something. Leaders are important to the church. Are we together, brethren? Leaders are very important. How I know that leaders are very important? 
is because it takes a long time to make a leader. God took 80 years to prepare Moses to be one of the greatest leaders of the church. Because, you see, to be a leader, you must be humble. Are we together? You must be spiritual and you must have a deep experience in the things of God. And so the apostle John was the last apostle. And while John was on the Isle of Patmos, I am sure that as a true leader, as a true shepherd, the church was on his heart. Are we together, brethren? The church was on his mind. Because most times, when the apostles were alive, if they had a controversy, if they had an issue, they would send to the apostle for an answer. And in this case, the apostle John was the final apostle. What would happen to the church when John is gone? What would happen to the church when no more apostles remain? And it was while John was contemplating these things, when the Bible says in verse 10 of Revelation chapter 1, it says, I was in the spirit. I was where? In the spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am what? Alpha and Omega. Let me explain to you before I go any further. Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet, and Omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet, which suggests that Jesus is saying, listen, apostles will die, but I am here today, and tomorrow, and will be here forever. What do you say? And he said to him, what you see, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches, which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. What you need to recognize, my brother and sisters, is that what is happening here, is that when John was concerned that the church was going to lose its last apostle, the chief apostle showed up. You're not with me, brethren. The chief apostle showed up and to let John know that the church of God has a faithful sentinel. The church of God has an apostle who never sleeps or slumber. The one who makes no mistake in his evaluation. And just in case you feel that the death of the apostles meant the death of counsel to the church, Jesus appeared as one who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, which represent the seven churches. You see, my brother and sisters, Jesus gave the promise. Upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So even when the apostles die, Jesus came to give John a message that would keep the church until the resurrection. What do you say? You say Jesus is aware of the various spiritual battles that the church would go through. And has given counsel that if the church take heed to this counsel, there will be spiritual revival and spiritual victory. What do you say? In Revelation chapter 2 to 3, Jesus gave those messages. Messages of encouragement. Messages of rebuke. Messages of promise. And I don't have time to go all through to read through the seven of them, but let me quickly give you an idea of what these messages are about. You should know already. These seven churches, my brother and sisters, that Jesus chose were actual seven local churches in Asia Minor. And they were situated in a very strategic way because the messenger who would take the message from John on the island of Patmos, if he follows the route, when he gets to the shores of Asia, the first church he would meet 
is Ephesus. Are you following me? And if he continues on that route, the next church he will see would be Smyrna. And then Pergamos, and then Thyatira, and Sardis, Philadelphia, and the final church would be Laodicea. So literally, these messages were, had a local and a present application. But what we have seen, my brothers and sisters, is that these messages being contained in the book Revelation, which not only has a local application, but has an end-time application, represent the conditions of the church from the time of the apostles to the end of time. Are we together? So Jesus, my brother and sister, the chief apostles, knows the various conditions and situations that the church will go through. Jesus saw that the church would go through the dark ages, but he knew that the church would triumph still. Because the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so quickly, Ephesus represents the early church from 34 AD to 100 AD, and he rebuked them for losing their first love. Smyrna was a persecuted church that represents the church from 100 AD to early 300 AD. This is the persecuted church. Pergamum representing the church from 300 to 500 AD is a compromising church. Are we together, brethren? When the Greek philosophers, when, when, the, when the theologians began to interact with the Greek philosophy of Aristotle and Plato and integrated it into the doctrine of the church, they were in a compromising position. Then Thyatira represents a church from 538 to 1560s. This is a compromised church. Are you following? So one church was on the verge of being compromised, and by the time we get to Thyatira, representing the church of the Dark Ages, it was already compromised. Then Sardis represented the church from 1500s, the time of Reformation, to the 1700s. This church was accused of having a name that is alive. It, it, it bears the name of the Reformers, but it was dead because it has, it has backslidden into the, the, the doctrines of the Middle Ages. Then Philadelphia represented a church from the 1700s to the 1844, the church of the great revivals in America, the, 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 the Baptists and the Methodists, those churches that were dedicated to the, the principles of God. And then Laodicea represents a church from 1844 until today. So Laodicea is a church that we are a part of. And that is the message I'll be focusing on today. So here is the message in Revelation chapter 3. Let me get here quickly. Revelation chapter 3, reading from verse 14. The Bible says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things say the what? The Amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. What you find is that in each of the messages to the seven churches, Jesus used one of his credentials as the Son of God to introduce himself. And each credential is relevant to that particular church. You see, the Amen represents one who is true, one who is faithful, one whose witness is correct. You see, brothers and sisters, some people will testify, and when they testify, you can't believe a word they say. Are we together? You have some people like that. When they tell you something, you have to take it with a grain of salt. You have to make sure you double-check it. But Jesus presents himself to Laodicea as a faithful and true witness, meaning that what I say, you can depend on it. What do you say? These are the words of one who makes no mistakes about his judgment. And you'll, you'll soon understand why Jesus introduced himself like that. He said in verse 15, 
I know thy works. I know thy what? Thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou art cold or hot. So because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. You see, brothers and sisters, when the apostles were giving counsel to the church, for the most part, they had to depend on either what they see when they come to the church or what other people tell them. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, sorry, 1 Corinthians, the book of 1 Corinthians, the apostle Paul was addressing issues that were written to him by Chloe and also things that he would have observed. But let me tell you something, my brothers and sisters. Jesus says, I know thy works. Jesus don't need to depend on church board to tell them anything. Jesus don't depend on the elders to come and tell them what is happening in the church. Jesus says, I know your works. I know your thoughts. I, your, I know your motive. Are we together? I know your works. You see, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. It reminds me of a situation in Luke chapter 11 where Jesus was invited to sit with the Pharisees for dinner and they watched him that he did not participate in the ceremonial washing as the Pharisees did. And when they were about to accuse Jesus, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you men wash the outside of the plate while inside you are full of evil and all manner of sins. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. You see, the church board and the pastor may only know what they see when you come to church, but Jesus knows what you do when you're at home. He, Jesus knows your behavior at your workplace, and he can say, I know your works. I know the result of your spiritual life. I know the product of your spiritual investment. I know your works. The apostles had to encourage the brethren to, the, to be faithful to their spiritual disciplines to grow in grace. But Jesus says, I know. I know whether you're studying the Bible or not. Are we together? I know whether you spend time with me in prayer or not. I know if you're being faithful in your business dealings or not. I know if you're being faithful in returning tithes and offering or not. I know if you are advancing in the kingdom and the grace of God or not. What do you say? Because you see, many of us, we can be a church and give the impression that we're spiritual. But Jesus says, I know your words. And like a spiritual doctor, like a spiritual doctor, Jesus does the diagnostic test and give the result. You know, my first time, I, I, I grew up never understanding the work of a doctor. I thought that when you go to a doctor... The doctor should immediately decide and know what is wrong with you. I never knew that the doctor needed to give you a blood test to do and to send you to the x-ray. And even then, they might still not be able to tell what's wrong with you. But Jesus, my brothers and sisters, Dr. Jesus does his evaluation the x-ray results are in. The blood works are in. And Jesus says, when he looks at Laodicea, he says, you are lukewarm. You are in such a spiritual condition that I am about to spew you out of my mouth. When we think we are doing well, Dr. Jesus says, 
you are neither cold nor hot. You see, the language used here for Laodicea truly represent Laodicea and city. You see, Laodicea was a wealthy city. It was a business person's paradise, historians tell us. When in AD 60, Laodicea suffered from a great earthquake, they were able to rebuild themselves without any help from the Roman Empire. They had money. Are we taking a brethren? Another thing that ladies I was known for was, a, was an expensive black wool that was soft and glossy. It was marketed there. They, were, they had a medical school and they also had an eye ointment made of local ingredients. And finally, they had a bubble bar that come out of the hills. The water, by the time the hot water reached the city, it became lukewarm. And this is the language that Jesus pulled on. That you are neither cold nor hot. Why is he in this condition? Why is he in this condition? The reason in given in verse 17 of chapter 3. It says, because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So what is the problem? The problem is that you are deceived. We are deceived about our spiritual condition. You say one thing, but you really are something else. You are diagnosing your own self rather than depending on Jesus' diagnosis. Are we together, brethren? You are doing your own spiritual evaluation. You are doing your own assessment. And not depending on Jesus. This represents, my brothers and sisters, a half-hearted commitment. Because in relation to this church, Jesus finds himself outside. I know this is not a message to get a lot of amen. Jesus finds himself outside, knocking on the door, and says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Because many of us must keep Jesus on the outside. We can't let him in the living room. We can't let him in the kitchen. We can't let him in the bedroom. Because what we are doing there, Jesus would not be pleased with it. This represents Christians who live their lives, their lives are filled with religion, but are not filled with the Holy Spirit. They are like the five virgins who are satisfied with just being among the crowd. The foolish virgins who they have an appearance enough to be among God's people, but their condition of the heart is rejectable in the sight of God. These are the ones who say, Lord, Lord, but they do not do what the Lord says. Christians who come to church every Sabbath, but live like the world in the week. Jesus is not in their hearts. And this is the cause for the great problem in the church. Let me tell you something, brethren. In God's church today, this Seventh Adventist church, if you decide to follow Jesus and be faithful to him, you are going to be persecuted. You are going to be sidelined. You are going to face hardship. I don't expect to get a lot of amen in everything, but I'm preaching the truth. People will misunderstand you because they themselves are not walking in the, in the foot of the cross. So they don't understand people who are walking in the foot of the cross. These are folks who are half-hearted in their commitment. But the thing I like about Jesus, sister, brother, and sister, is Jesus has a solution for every problem. When, I, when you read the rebuke that Jesus gave the Pharisee, you almost want to think that Jesus is being rude. 
Jesus has a solution. Dr. Jesus has a medication for every spiritual malady. I'm amazed. Before I even touch ladies, I'm amazed at how Jesus treated the Pharisees. You know, when, I, when you read the rebuke that Jesus gave the Pharisee, you almost want to think that Jesus is being rude. Matthew 23 and Luke chapter 11. You almost want to think that Jesus is being out of order and rude when he told them you're, you're a whitewashed sepulchre. Outside you appear to men like you're good, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. You almost want to think that Jesus is being rude, but when I thought about it, I said to myself, this is the only counsel that will help them. Are we together, brethren? There are some people that the only thing that can help them is to tell them the truth. You look like a Christian, but you're living like the world. Dr. Jesus has a solution for ladies here. What do you say? This is the only church he has no commendation for, but yet he has a solution. He has a medication, and he wrote it up. And gave it to the Apostle John. Because he knew that this church would need it. This church that is self-deceived can be helped. And he says in verse 18. I counsel thee. Are we together? I counsel thee. Laodicea, you are in serious trouble. But there is hope. What do you say? There is hope in Jesus. And the hope, he says, I counsel thee, buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. And then he said in verse 19, full of love and grace, he says, as many as I love. It is because I love you. It's not because I hate you. It is because I love you why I'm telling you the truth. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. If you have people in your life who you can't tell the truth, it means that they want to control you. Are we together, Virgin? If you have people that you can't tell the truth and they don't get upset, it means that they want to control you. You have to avoid them. But if you genuinely love people and, and you care for their future, you are going to prayerfully tell them the truth. And that's one thing about Jesus. <laughs> that's why Ella, Ella Knight, that's why Ellen White says his life was so difficult. Bridget, let me tell you something. It's not an easy thing to be a Christian, you know. <laughs> Every now and then, when the church bite me and I, and, I, and I said, I feel like giving up, the Lord remind me, say, what about Jesus? Do you remember how they treat Jesus? Do you remember that he wasn't very popular in the church? Hello? Jesus was popular outside. <laughs> I would imagine from the first time Jesus got before the church and preached and said, Today, this scripture is fulfilling your ear. And then they, they throw him outside. And they don't give no, no more preaching appointment for him. <laughs> they don't give no more preaching appointment. He goes and preaches on the seaside and on the hillside. But he tells the truth. What do you say? And it is saving truth. Let me, go, let me break it down for you. Gold tried in fire represents the work that must be done to your faith. I spoke about this on Wednesday night about spiritual maturity. Represents your behavior, your faith, and your understanding. Gold of faith, you see, brothers and sisters, is the faith... 
Faith is how you come to know God. Are we together? The Bible says he that come to him must believe. But the problem is, even though you come to him by faith and, and, and you believe him, as you walk the Christian pathway, you are going to be challenged. Are we together? Your faith is going to be challenged and some of us, rather than enduring the challenge, we give up. Are you following? Just look at the journey of the children of Israel from Egypt. God works some amazing miracle to demonstrate his power. When they came to the Red Sea and Pharaoh was behind them, the people chastised Moses and said, Moses, did you bring us out here to kill us? And Moses says, stand still and see the salvation of God. What do you say? And God made a way for them in the sea. And they walked through it. And when they came across and, and Pharaoh's army was drawn in the sea, they celebrated their faith was strong. But as they walked a little, they wanted water and there was no water. What did they do? Did they still believe? No. They began to rebel again and say, God, is God among us or not? Faith. But the Bible tells us, my brothers and sisters, that if we have, if we're going to have faith of gold, we must endure the trying of our faith. You're not with the brethren. We must endure the trying of our faith. Because James says, he that waver it is like a wave of sea and he will receive nothing from the Lord. And then why it says that when we are tried, <laughs> she says it is no easy thing to be called and named a Christian. When God will give us a bitter cup to drink and if we are willing to drink it, we will be purified and be better prepared for the next trial. But if we give up, we lose that blessing and are less prepared for the next trial. So to, go, to have a gold of a faith of gold, we need to endure the trial of our faith. In 1 Peter chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12, the Bible says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange things happen unto you. But rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also. You see, brother and sister, Jesus is pulling on the illustration of how gold is refined. And if the people in Hanover knew this, they would just need to put the gold that they find in fire. <laughs> and if you put it in fire and it comes out, it means that it's gold. <laughs> Are we together? God does not put you in fire unless he knew there was something precious to come out. God does not put you through trials unless he knew there was something about you that he wanted to bring out. Something precious, something meaningful that when people look at you, they say, where did this man come from? Where did this woman come from? But what they don't know is the fire that you have been through. That's why when the angel says, when, who are these and when came, the angel says, these are they who came out of fire. These are they who when church people turn their backs on them, they still remain faithful to me. These are they when their family and their friends turn from them, they are still faithful. When their children died and were sick, when they lose their job, they were still faithful to me. They come out of great tribulation. 
to have gold of faith, you must endure the trial of your faith. What do you say? And a gold of faith, my brother and sisters, will produce white raiment. Are we together? The character will not remain the same. When you have faith that endures the test and trial, your character will reflect the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, buy of me white raiment. Are we together? Buy of me white raiment. The white raiment is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But many of us think that the covering of Christ's righteousness only represents a, 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 a facade covering where your behavior should not correspond to the righteousness of Christ. So Christ will cover. But Ellen White says in the book Christ of the Lesson that Christ's righteousness will not cover one sin. <laughs> Christ's righteousness will not cover one cherished sin. There are some of us who believe that because we are part of the church and we are doing good things in the church, then Christ won't spew us out of his mouth. Well, don't bet on it. Because Jesus had made provision for his righteousness that he purchased at a great cost. Are we together? And those who come into the wedding without a wedding garment go to Matthew 22 and learn what happened to them. The Bible says that when they came in, he said, we, how did you get inside here, brother? <laughs> how did you get inside here without a wedding garment? And the Bible said he was speechless because he knew that he could have done better. And he was cast into outer darkness. In Revelation chapter 3, let's read that. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5. The Bible says, he that overcometh, the same shall be what? Clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And then the second thing that Jesus, the third thing that Jesus recommends to Laodicea is I self. What did he recommend? I self. Because as I said on Wednesday night, people, believers, Christians, semi Adventists, who escape the corruption of the world but are not growing, Peter says they are blind. Are we together? You are blind or backslidden and you forgot that you are being purged from your own sins. But Jesus says you need I salve. And this I salve comes, yes, from the help of the Holy Spirit to discern spiritual things. But, but your, 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 your spiritual discernment improve the more you practice righteousness. The more you do what is right, the more you discern what is evil. That's what the Apostle Paul said in Hebrews chapter 5. That the mature are those who have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Jesus, brothers and sisters, stands at the door and knock and says, Listen, I have lots of goods out here. Come and buy of me. And it's free. Are we together? Free of course that we buy of him. What I want you to remember, brethren, as I wrap this up, is that Laodicea is a church that will stand before God without a mediator. You're not with the brethren. Laodicea is a church where Ellen White says that there will be a revival of godliness that has never been seen before. So Jesus can play with his church. Are we together? Jesus is telling us what is required for Laodicea to survive. Laodicea is a church that will face and overcome the, bar, the mark of the beast. You're not with me, brethren. 
So if we are going to go through those difficult times, Laodicea is a church that will go through the seven last plagues. So you're going to need the help. You're going to need everything that Jesus has. Sometimes you go to a buffet and they ask you what you want. They say, give you everything. <laughs> when you go to Jesus, he said, ask him, say, Jesus, give me everything. Everything on the plate. Don't let him go back with anything. Buy out everything from Jesus. Laodicea is a church, my brothers and sisters, that will face the final period of the, execute, the, the, the investigative judgment when Jesus says, he that is filthy, let him remain filthy still. He that is holy. And I said to myself, the other day I was reflecting on this whole matter of the day of atonement. And I said that when somebody dies, their, their case has been decided. But we are living in a period of time when you can be alive but your case decided. You're not following me, brethren. So we can't delay our spiritual preparation for a future time. We of any generation cannot delay our spiritual preparation. Every test and trial that comes to us is an opportunity to grow and to advance in the Christian pathway. Let us not give up. What do you say? Let us not give up. I close by sharing with you from, from a testimonies, volume one. Page 186. Ellen White says, and I'm going to summarize some of it. When this message to Laodicea was first presented in the 1840s and late 1840s and early 1850s, she says, it brought about a great revival that people at that time felt would bring an usher in the loud cry. But as time passed, my brothers and sisters, and the brethren did not see the results, they became weary of the way. And Ellen White says that God will not complete his work in a few short months. Listen to me carefully. Now this is very important. God will not complete his work in a few short months. Here is why. She says... God will prove his people. Jesus bears patiently with them and does not spew them out of his mouth in a moment. Said the angel, God is weighing his people. And listen to this very carefully now. If the message had been of us short duration, as many of us suppose, there would have been no time for them to develop character. Many move from feeling, not from principle and faith. And this solemn, fearful message tear them up. If wrought upon their feelings and excited their fears, but did not accomplish a work God designed for them. Lest his people should be deceived about themselves, he gave them time for the excitement to wear off. Are we together, brethren? <laughs> Do you realize what separated the wise from the foolish virgins? Time. You're not with me, brethren. It's time because if the bridegroom had come immediately, all of them would have gone in. It was time that gave evidence that one set never had the extra oil that they need. You see, my brother and sisters, God don't work in excitement too much. <laughs> and some of us are waiting for the excitement of the latter in power to move us to action. But Jesus is saying, he's giving you time for character to develop. I wish I could sit here and talk about this for the rest of the afternoon, my brothers and sisters. That character development in the book, Acts of the Apostles, one of my favorite quotations, page 51, Ellen White says, my brothers and sisters, it is not 
a conclusive evidence that a man is a Christian simply because he exercised great spiritual extra ecstasy under extraordinary circumstance. Holiness is not rapture. It is something that happens on a daily basis. It is living by faith in the mundane experience of life and still be a Christian. So holiness is not the good feeling you have in worship. Holiness is how you act in the workplace. Holiness is how you behave at home and not how you feel at church. He says God leads his people on step by step. He brings them up to different points calculated to manifest what is in the heart. She says some endure at one point but fall off at the next. Every advance point the heart is tested and tried a little closer. <laughs> in that way, we're I know I get, get a lot of amen to this. Let me tell you something. God knows better than ourselves. <laughs> Sometimes we feel that we are holy and all right and if Jesus come now ready for heaven. But then God bring a situation in our lives that shows that we are not ready. God let somebody step on our toe. Are we together? God let something happen to us and we start to curse and swear like Peter. You see, when God done with us, brethren, we are going to be ready. What do you say? <laughs> it's not we decide when we are ready. <laughs> And it is because of that why the Bible says that we think that we are rich and increased with goods. When Jesus says you are poor, miserable, blind, and naked. And then she says, I was shown the people of God and saw them mightily shaken. Some with strong faith and agonizing cries were pleading with God. Their countenances were pale and marked with deep anxiety. Expresses of their inner struggle. Firmness and great earnestness were expressed in their countenances. While large drops of perspir perspiration fell from their foreheads. Now and then their faces would light up with the marks of God's approbation. And again the same solemn, earnest, anxious look would settle upon them. And then she saw the same congregation again. She says... Some I saw did not participate in this work of organizing and pleading with God. You see, brethren, we need to learn something about the antitypical day of atonement. In the, in the early, in the Israelite camp, the day of atonement was very solemn. Are we together? The people had to prepare themselves with fasting and prayer. An earnest devotion. And it requires the same earnestness for those of us who are living in the real day of atonement. She says, as the praying ones continue their earnest cries, a ray of light from Jesus would at times come to them to encourage their hearts and light up their countenance. I asked the meaning of the shaking and I, I, I'd seen and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called for by the counsel of the true witness. This message will cause a shaking. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear this straight testimony. They will rise up against it and this will cause a shaking among God's people. If we take heed to this message, my brother and sisters, the, the prescription that Dr. Jesus gives to the church, it will bring about the revival that will usher in the loud cry message. Are we together, brethren? But the challenge among God's people is that this work is an individual work. Only you can know if you're overcoming the battles that you're fighting personally. Only you can know if you're truly enduring the trial of your faith. Only you can know 
if Jesus is on the outside of your heart or he's sitting on the inside of your heart. And so the most I can do is to preach his message. I want you to, my brothers and sisters, that even though Laodicea is a church that got the most, the severest rebuke, Jesus has a solution for you. What do you say? Dr. Jesus has a solution. He's calling his church to repent and be zealous about putting away sin and sinful practices for your life. And then you'll have a part in the kingdom because anyone anyway, says that if you do not receive the early rain, you will not receive the latter rain. The latter rain will be falling all around you and you don't even know because you have no experience anything that the Spirit of God. I close with this illustration, you know. When I was, I was living in the country in Maroon Town, St. James, we, we never had running water in the James. And we had to depend on drum or go to the river. And there was a time in the summer when there was a long drought, so there was no water. And one Sunday I was home with my cousin and my mother and the drum was empty. My cousin knew he needed to wash his clothes, but he, he delayed, he delayed. But then something strange happened. The clothes begin to set and become dark. And a little drops of rain began to fall. And he began to rejoice. He began to be happy because he was saying to himself, he don't need to go for water anymore because the rain is coming. But then during the rejoicing, he realized that if the rain didn't come for a long time, he needs to wash the drum before him take water. So he stopped and started washing the drum. And as soon as he was done washing the drum, the rain stopped. He did not benefit from the rain because the drum was not prepared. My brothers and sisters, today is time to get ready. Today is to the time to have the vessel ready so that when the latter rain begins to pour, you are ready to receive it. When the latter rain begins to pour, it's not preparation time. No, it's preparation time. No, when there is no persecution as such. No, where there, there, there is no excitement. No, is the time to build character. Are we together, brethren? It is not a popular thing, but it is, it is the right thing. Because now when everybody else is gallivanting and enjoying themselves, it's the time for us to get ready. And the experience of the pandemic should show us that things can happen in a short space of time. I tell you why it says that the, the final movements are going to be a rapid one. Let's get ready when things begin to happen. God bless you.